So far we've been considering beams, and in particular the reaction force is generated at beam supports. In this lecture we're going to introduce a new type of structure known as a pin jointed structure or truss. In a truss it's the combination of sub-elements within the structure acting together that allow the truss as a whole to carry loads over large spans. Trusses are generally more efficient than beams at spanning large distances. As the name suggests, these type of structures can be considered as a combination of simple structural elements or members joined together at pin joints. These pin joints between members are typically called nodes. The joints between members are assumed not to transfer any moment, only forces. The joints can be thought of as hinges allowing free rotation. If external loads are applied only to nodes, then the individual elements of the structure will only develop axial forces. This means they will be in a state of tension or compression, or they may not carry any axial load at all, depending on the structural configuration. In any event, we assume, unlike beams, the elements of a truss do not bend. So we can think of our truss as acting like a pathway that allows loads to be transmitted from one part of the structure to another. In fact, all any structure is, is a pathway that allows loads to be transmitted from point A to point B, whether that's from the roof of a house down into the foundations of a house, or from the deck of a bridge into the bridge foundations. Our task in this lecture is to work out how those loads are transmitted from point A to point B within the structure. Now, in the same way as we did with our 2D force systems, we're going to assume that our structures are two-dimensional. Now, obviously, the trusses in real life are actually three-dimensional because they've got a thickness, but we can analyse the trusses by assuming that they're two-dimensional and by only considering forces within the plane of the structure. You'll probably have noticed that trusses are arranged in a triangular form. This is because with this arrangement of members, every node or joint within the structure is held in place vertically and horizontally by the members that connect into it. This will become clearer when we start to analyse trusses in more detail. But basically, this triangulation within the structure allows it to hold its shape when external loads are applied to it. A pin-jointed structure that doesn't hold its shape when loads are applied to it is called a mechanism. And a lack of triangulation in a pin-jointed structure will typically lead to a mechanism and mechanisms aren't a suitable form of structure. So we'll discuss mechanisms in a little bit more detail when we analyse trusses in the upcoming lectures. Let's think for a minute about what's happening in the individual elements within a truss structure. Consider a single member of a truss that's subject to a force applied at each end. In this case, let's assume a compression force applied in line with the longitudinal axis of the member. For short, we'll call this an axial compression force. To resist or balance this force, an internal force must be generated within the member itself. Otherwise, the member would simply crumble under the influence of the external load. We can represent this internal force with arrows pointing outwards, opposing the external force applied at each end. Once we know the magnitude and direction of this internal force, we can design the member itself to be big enough to provide this internal reaction. On the other hand, if a tensile force was applied at each end of the member trying to stretch or pull it, an internal force would develop within the member to resist this external force. The whole point of what we'll be doing in this section is working out ways of determining these internal member forces within truss structures when external loads are applied to nodes or joints. So there's a range of commonly used truss configurations. The Warren, Pratt and Hoe trusses are probably among the most popular. Their ability to span large distances efficiently make them especially popular for large spanning roof and bridge structures. Everything we've discussed in this lecture has referred to the idealised model of a truss. Just like when we were talking about beam supports, we said that the actual behaviour of our model may be different from the real world behaviour of the support that we're, we're modelling. Now the same or a similar thing is true when we're talking about trusses. We have an idealised model and the real world behaviour of our truss will be, will be different from that model. In particular, when we talk about the joints within a truss, we said that the joints behave as pin joints, uh, they don't transmit any bending moment and they can, they're free to rotate. Now, in reality, that's not necessarily the case. And in the next lecture, we'll discuss the differences between our idealised truss models and real world trusses.